Today we're going to do a initial styling video of a Blue Alps Juniper. This tree was a cutting that was created in 2006. In 2008 I wired the trunk and started growing it on specifically for bonsai. We wanted to have a lot of branches that we could utilize and we wanted to thicken up the trunk. So at one time this tree was about four feet tall. It was cut back about five years ago and it's just been repeatedly cut back and worked over the last few years. It was put in that trainer um, two years ago and now Mike Rogers is going to do the initial styling and shaping of this Blue Alps. Uh, do you want to turn the juniper right now just to kind of show people what it looks like? If it's a little dark, I apologize. We're underneath the pole barn. So the tree at this point is 14 years from a cutting. Take it away, Mike. <laughs> All right, so uh, this tree, the trunk was wired as a young tree, so it's got some pretty nice movement in it. Uh, gonna get rid of some of the stuff that we don't you know we're not gonna use. And with a juniper, you know, just cut branches off, you make gins, so you're going to leave nubs everywhere. It's going to be a nice big gin at the base. What is this tool? This is a tool that was made in Europe. Um, Mauro Stemberger has a friend that makes these tools and sells them for like $30. It's uh, basically carbon steel sharpened on both sides, put it into a, a handle that he made. So it's a, a really nice tool for stripping the bar. That's, that's what it was made for. How often do you have to sharpen it? Uh, he said you'd never have to sharpen it. He has one that he's been using for 10 years and he says it's still sharp as it was when he got it. So. How long have you had it? I've had it um, when he was here. When? Uh, okay. When Four months back, ago? Three months ago? Yeah, about a couple months ago. That's when I got it from him. That seemed to work really well. Looks really good. These are my gin pliers. And all you're doing is basically removing the anything that's young that's that still has the moisture th coming, pulling up through it through the cambium, just stripping it right down to the sapwood and heartwood. Correct? Exactly. You can't uh, can't really do anything with something that hasn't turned to wood yet. So all of that is being removed and. Uh, getting rid of the bark. Now will you go back and do some more detailed carving on something like this in a month? Or do you do most of your carving at the initial cleanup? I, I usually like to let it dry out for a couple months. Um, you can even let it go, uh, you know, you can even let it go a year and, uh, and, and start to rot. And then, uh, you know, you start carving away the soft parts and wind up. Sometimes you get actually more character by doing it that way. Let nature do a little bit of yeah. carving itself. That's what we do a lot at the shop, mostly um, just because of the pure volume of trees that we have to work. By the time we get to them, they've started to erode, and it really does add a lot of character. Um, talk about how often you... Uh, apply lime sulfur uh here in florida lime sulfur should probably be applied about twice a year uh, 
sometimes if you have a lot of trees, it's hard to get back to everything twice a year, so at least once a year. And the way you apply it, take a brass brush, clean it up, brush it, moisten it, put it on full strength? I put it on full strength. Um, yeah, if you moisten the uh, moisten the wood, uh, it actually uh, actually soaks in a lot better. Right now, you're using the concave cutters to split the dead wood, give it a little bit more character. Yeah, some just more movement. Getting rid of some of this. Uh, roundness of the dead wood to give it some initial character. I'm also going to um, get rid of most of this top. There's plenty of branches up here to form a top with and, and a lot of this is... Uh... Would that be classified as redundant? A lot of the extra top up there? Yes, well, you know, you have a long, a long section here that with no movement, and you got nice movement in here, and then it turns into a, you know, if, if you keep all this, you really lose a lot of uh, uh, paper and character, so I'm just going to uh, get rid of all this heavy wood up here and turn it into a gin. We have sound effects in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so just on a side note, this is about the exact size that that was when it was started in 2006. Uh, Mike and I went to a huge nursery and picked up this Blue Alps that I had never seen before. You see how it has a bluish cast. I don't know if you can see it in this light. But it's very similar to Femina, but it's more bluish. And um, I had picked up a real old piece and I did about 200 cuttings like this. Sunk them in the perlite and then let them grow for two years and then wire the trunk and that's letting it grow. That's what you end up getting. They, they develop much quicker than our smaller varieties of junipers like the Percumbens, Nana, or even Parsonite. It thickens up faster than that. It's more of an upright tree. I think the original Blue Alps came from, wasn't it Oregon? Yeah, Joe, Joe Harris had a bunch of them in the ground at the nursery he was working at. Yeah. They had did the same theory. They wired them up and put them in the ground, but they had five, six inch trunks. Uh, but, you know, growing them in the ground, this one has been container grown its whole life. If I had put it in the ground, it probably would have been two or three times this size as far as thickness. The problem with putting junipers in the ground here in Florida is we have pure sugar sand to grow in, the roots go everywhere, so exactly. it's a little bit difficult to get them back out of the ground and have them do well. That's that's why we didn't, didn't do it unless we amended the soil. Like I have some in the ground now, but it took a long time to figure that out. Because it's like you're collecting a plant all over again every time you take them out of the ground. Could you put a big pot into the ground and then grow them like that, like a big? It plant? helps. It helps inhibit them. They, but you almost don't even have to put them in the ground at that point. You just let them grow into the ground from the pot. Yeah. And it's just, you know. True. You get a lot of the good soil. You can fertilize in the pot to keep a lot of feeders in there, and you still get the escaping roots, which help thicken up the trunk. That's kind of what happened at Mike's nursery. <laughs> he had a lot of stuff that escaped, and the trunks just blew up. So why don't you talk about how much foliage you can take off this safely without endangering the tree. Well, actually, the, the strength of the uh, juniper is in the foliage, so I would say 
can probably take off maybe 50% of the foliage. Uh, you really have to leave enough foliage for the tree to uh, have strength because it's like a, a lot of trees you can take most of it or even all the foliage off and the, and the trunk and the roots will push out but uh, junipers aren't like that the foliage is what pulls the strength up from the roots even if even if the tree doesn't have many roots, the foliage is what makes uh, makes new roots. So you really have to leave enough foliage for the tree to have the strength to recover. See, a lot of beginners uh, make the mistake of they buy a tree from a nursery. They take the tree and they cut. Even if they stick, keep 50% of the foliage on there, they cut them much usually much harder than that and then they repot the tree um, cut 50 or 60 percent of the roots off as well and put it in a pot how do you feel about that what are your what are your thoughts on well the, the general consensus is that you do one one thing to a tree in a season if you're going to completely restart uh, restyle the tree then you should wait till the next year to repot it. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to make sure that that was uh, reiterated because a lot of people will buy a tree at, you know, a box store or even a mom and pop shop. If it's beautiful, it has a nice fat trunk, but it's pop bound, it's weak. And then they cut 90% of the foliage off and put it in a pot and say, look, I made a bonsai tree. And then the tree dies two months I later. Heard Joe bon Holly, remember? Oh you yeah, that's right. One? Yep. <clears throat> They're definitely not ficuses. So today you're gonna carve the deadwood. Uh, you're gonna do, you're gonna do some wiring on the branching. What is what is your typical aftercare on a juniper? It's April, by the way, right now. Yes, April. Um, generally, April here is a lot cooler than it is right now. So, um, since we're not repotting this tree and we're just going to wire it out, I, I would say it can go back out into the full sun. Since it, uh, right now, we're having a bit of a springy weather because it's rainy and it's cool, so that's really the kind of, uh, kind of weather that junipers like. They, they really don't like it when it gets 90, 95 degrees. So if you're going to do this to a juniper, do it before summertime gets here. And you would wait till January, February of next year to repot this into a bonsai pot. Yeah, probably February, you know, late January. Um, generally, uh, a lot of people say to repot junipers in March, but sometimes by the time March gets here, it's too hot. Yeah, it's, it's hot. So yeah. uh, late January, early February is a good time to repot junipers here in Florida, especially Central Florida, right? Yeah. When you were living down in Fort Lauderdale, which is more considered South Florida, did you repot mostly January? Yeah, we we did most of our uh, conifers in January. That was the only time it was even cool down there was in January. By the time February rolled around, it was starting to get you know back into the 80s. Up in the Panhandle, are they different enough to where they can do it in April, or is it getting too hot even up there? No, the Panhandle is. I think there's zone eight, right? Zone eight, and I think even when you get out into the west, you may even get some zone seven. Yeah. So, you know, they're they're at least a month behind us, so they they should be able to go into April to repot. Actually, I would probably even up there, I would probably repot in March. We have a lot of people that watch the uh, that have been watching the Juniper series on 
um, YouTube, and I'm having people ask questions all the way up to New York, Michigan, California. But, you know, there's... We want to reiterate that January, February is our repotting, <laughs> not New York's. I think. Uh, yeah, they're getting snow up there. Yeah, now. exactly. They're, <laughs> they're repotting in June, right? Yeah, uh, May or June. I have no idea. I, I yeah. would say they should probably repot, you know, late April, early May. Uh, this is probably their last thing of snow they're going to get. I would say maybe this year. Some, sometimes, you know, it has, when you get up into Michigan, you know, I have family up there, and I've, it, it has snowed up there in June. Yeah, May, June, exactly. That's yeah. where all my old family's from. And yeah. they had they were complaining how hot it was a couple of years ago in April, and they were planting. I said, you should probably wait. <laughs> <laughs> and in at the end of May, beginning of June, they had another snow, and everything they planted died. Basically, I'm going to clean out some of this inside foliage. But, uh, get rid of some of these heavy branches that I know I'm not going to use. On a juniper, they tend to bud out at the base of other branches, and that's one thing you always want to keep cleaned out because if a if a tree buds at the base of a branch that you want to use then that bud is going to take the strength away from the branch it's it's beneficial if you want to replace the branch if you, if you want to replace the branch if you don't want to replace yeah. the branch then you got to commit on that right yeah i'm also getting rid of a lot of these branches that are way too long the foliage way out at the end those branches are not going to work uh, trying to make a compact shape with this tree. Do you want to talk about different ways to propagate junipers? Well, the, the easiest and most prolific way is to do cuttings. And here in Florida, we do cuttings starting in mid-December. Uh, they root wilt really well over the winter time because it's cool, and that's when the juniper's roots grow is in the winter time. So, um, put, we put our cuttings in in mid-December, and then let them root over the winter. Are you going to leave that long branch that's on the front right there facing me? This one? No, the one that's on the opposite side of you. The one touching the bottom of the pot, the top of the pot. That. You know. I, I was thinking about I'm probably not going to keep it. It's just, just too long. I got foliage way out here. And, um, uh, but. Thank you. <laughs> That's bugging me. <laughs> I hope you're not taking it all the way out. Well, this is all just. It's not going to be part of the branch. Um, initially, when you have uh, do the initial styling on a juniper, you don't want to shorten these branches because all the growing tips are out here and you want it to recover. So you really need to leave all these growing long shoots out here to uh, give the tree strength. You don't want to uh, cut it back to nothing. Otherwise, it's just not going to have the strength since the growth, uh, the, the vitality in a juniper is, is in the uh, foliage, you need to leave the strong foliage until it starts budding back. And then you come back in here and take all this off. Okay. So what kind of fertilizer do you use, Mike, on your junipers? I have used pretty much everything. Any, any fertilizer is better than no fertilizer. Some people like the organic fertilizer. Once you put a tree in a pot, it's probably better to use organic fertilizer because it doesn't promote such rampant growth. But 
chemical fertilizer, you know, if you, if you can't do the organics, the chemicals, they grow just fine on chemical fertilizer. You just get more growth, which you have to make, you have to handle that. And how do you handle excessive growth on a juniper? Well, you're going to have to trim them more. Yeah. What's the typical... What's what's the typical uh, trimming regime regime on a the yearly care of a juniper? You've taken the juniper, you've cut it back, you've wired it and shaped it. You haven't repotted it, so it has good good roots underneath it for strength throughout the year. When do you think would be the next time we're going to have to trim that tree? I would probably give this tree three or four months to recover from being wired, and then it would be time to come in here and start trimming. So I'm going to leave these all these branches long because you don't want to cut all your growth tips off. Now that we've opened this up, these growth tips are going to pull the strength into this branch and it'll encourage it to uh, bud back. So once it starts budding back, then you can come in here and shorten all these growth tips up. But if you take all the growth tips off now, um, it's just going to retard the growth of the plant and you know you may lose branches right junipers get their strength from their foliage and especially from the growth tips the extending whips of uh, growth how long would you leave the wire on this tree if it's uh, put in optimal conditions I would say probably the end of summer Will it have will it have been dug in a little bit by then? It should should have it should have dug in a little bit by the end of summer. But that uh, doesn't hurt junipers. Junipers are better to let them dig in a little bit. Uh, it just adds a little character. It's not like a Japanese maple where it just destroys the bark to have the, the wire dig in. Uh, pines and junipers uh, they can dig in a little bit, and it's better. If it digs in a little bit, uh, the branch is going to hold more in the position that you place it. So a juniper isn't as much like a ficus where it's not going to spring right back pretty quick after it sets. Do they do they set pretty good, or will they tend to be have to be rewired periodically? Well, most juniper bones I have wire on them pretty much all the time because as they grow, um, they do have a tendency to uh, spring back a little bit. Once your, once your main branches are, are set, then your main branches generally aren't going to be springing back, but you're always getting new growth, and, uh, and that new growth has to be placed Otherwise, the tree just starts looking shaggy. So, uh, most juniper bones I always have some kind of wire on them almost all the time. So, they're in a perpetual state of refinement. Exactly. Now, I know a lot of the books, the original books back from the 60s and 70s always talked about um, pinching the tips of your juniper repeatedly throughout the growth season, but that's been, that's been adjusted and changed throughout the decades. What, is the, uh, what, what have you found the best way to refine this needle type juniper to get it dense and full? Trim at the most two maybe three times a year, depending on the growth of the tree. Uh, I, over the years, I've seen a lot, of, um, a lot of junipers decline just from pinching all the time. Um, junipers need to grow um, since the strength is in the foliage. So if you're constantly pinching them, then they're not growing and then the tree starts declining. And I've seen some really good junipers over the years that have declined just from improper pruning. So now you let a juniper grow. Uh, 
I would say prune them, prune them good uh, in May and October. Uh, most needle junipers uh, respond well by pruning them in May and October. And if it's not growing good, then you have to skip one of those prunings. If it's growing really good, maybe you can add one, but uh, I, I probably wouldn't do three hard prunings. Uh, if it's growing really good, two, two good hard prunings a year is, is good. <clears throat> and if it's growing really good, maybe maybe a, a light pruning in between that. Just to keep the sunlight hitting in yeah. inside of the branches. Maybe thin it out a little bit going into winter like you would a pine just so that the sun will get into the uh, you know the spaces the interior of the tree. That's really important with junipers. Full sun. Yep. Get rid of that branch. What do you think about uh, foliar feeding the tree? How do you feel about that? Well, all trees um, can benefit from foliar feeding, including junipers and pines. So the thing about foliar feeding is that you have to mix the liquid. Um, and then spray it on. So, I mean, that's time, that's pretty time consuming. So, if you have a lot of trees, then sometimes foliar feeding just isn't feasible. So, but any tree will, will benefit from foliar feeding in addition to uh, the foliage, that, the fertilizer that you put on the roots. So uh, talk about the uh, type of soil that you've used, that you've grown junipers in over the years, and what is your favorite? Well, you really have to use a well-drained soil. Back when I first started, uh, we didn't have well-drained soil. We basically had soil with uh, perlite added to it. That was 1600s? Yeah. <laughs> when was that, the 60s, 70s? Yeah, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, nobody heard of uh, a gravel mix until a friend of mine went to Japan and uh, came back and said that they were growing trees in Japan a lot different in a lot different soil than what we were using. So... Uh, me and her started mixing up. They were actually in the, uh, well, they started out in the terrazzo business. And then when terrazzo went out of style, they switched over to Chattahoochee decks. So they were always getting in uh, train car loads of uh, gra different gravels. And they had uh, lava rock and Chattahoochee and stuff like that. So we, we started mixing up lava rock and Chattahoochee and fir bark and made the first gravel mix that as far as I'm, as far as I know, was, you know, the, the earliest gravel mix in the country. I don't know of anybody else that was doing it before us. Definitely in Florida. Yeah, definitely in Florida. Nobody was doing it in Florida. <clears throat> Do you know when Jim Smith started using calcinated clay? Um, I don't really, uh, uh, I was surprised when I went to his place one time and everything was in turfus and uh, um, it, I never did like turfus, a lot of people like turfus. I know several people right now that um, grow junipers and straight turfus. I know um, uh, Ben Agresta bought half a dozen uh, big junipers from, what's that guy's name, 
He's a, uh, yeah, artist down in South Florida. Or yeah. Central, South Central. Um, can't remember his name. I know who you mean. But uh, they're growing in straight turfus and they're doing fine. They were great looking trees. I mean, they're healthy, they're growing, they're everything. Um, so I can't really fault that because the, <laughs> the trees are doing really right. well. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> You know, I don't know if you watch anything online, but there's huge debates on that, on the boards, different areas of the country where a lot of people don't like turfus, yep. especially when you're using heavy chemical fertilizers and they, they're they saying that the <clears throat> exchange, the ion exchange has a negative ion exchange where the salts build up into the matrix of the turfus and then it becomes um, toxic to the roots where they say Akadama has a positive ion exchange and it, you don't have to worry about the salts building up with the same as it would with turfus. I don't know. I don't, I don't have the, soil, the, the science behind it. But I know that we used to use turfus and we stopped using turfus. And um, I notice I get more feeder roots. Um, but we used turfus for over 10 years in our mix. I mean, that was what you and I decided to start using 15 years ago or 20 years ago well I've always thought that turf has stayed too wet yeah which the soil is wet and um, Ryan Neal has a degree in horticulture and the way he explains it is that Turfus absorbs a hundred times its weight in water, but it holds the water so that so well that the plant can't pull the water out of right. the turfus. That's the that's the whole negative ion exchange theory, right? So, and I've seen plants that are wilted, but the soil is wet. Yeah. Because it can't pull the moisture. The only available moisture is the moisture that's between the particles right. in the mix. Um, it, it, it just absorbs the water, period, and it doesn't let it go. So that was my, uh, um, it was always, my beef about turfus is that it was just always wet. So, I quit using turfus a long time ago just for that reason. Uh, so I, I don't know the mechanics of these people that are actually growing junipers in straight turfus. I, um, I haven't used turfus in decades. So what is your mix currently with junipers? What would you suggest? Right now I'm using uh, Haydite, which is the calcinated clay, lava, and akadama. And I, if I can get pumice, right now I have pumice, so I put pumice in there. So I have those four things in my mix. That's, yeah, that's exactly what we're using. Black lava, red lava, akadama, and pumice. And it seems to, the trees seem to thrive in it. It's, it's a fabulous mix. Yeah. I, I really like it. I, I, I have seen more growth and more yeah. refinement on my pines and my junipers since we started using it. It's probably the, you know, probably the best mix that we've come up with and uh, ever. Yeah. Since we, even since we started using it. You know, just using that gravel mix, which was basically, when we first started was Chattahoochee, fine Chattahoochee, but uh, we just added the fine Chattahoochee because we wanted to put something else in the mix besides lava, and we were using fir bark. And just to clarify with everybody, Chattahoochee is a stone from Chattahoochee River, correct? Yes, it, it's a river stone. Um, it's non-porous, so it doesn't absorb any water or nutrients and doesn't release any. It's just an inert. Uh, thing to put in there. And so imagine things would dry out faster in it. Yeah, over the years I just quit using the Chattahoochee because it wasn't it wasn't serving any purpose. Just fill and it was wait. Fill, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was something that 
we started with because it was available. Right. And other than the lava, that's all we had. So Who was your friend that started doing this? Helen Souter. Okay. Um, she it? died quite some time ago. She was um, had in fact all the old friends I had are all dead now. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, they, she also she went to Japan every year for quite a number of years, and uh, she would in import container loads of tokenami and hutuku pots from Japan. So they had a wholesale uh, bonsai pot business in addition to the, I'm gonna get rid of this branch here, I don't like it. Uh, Can you show the uh, camera where you think the front is? Well, this is the front. Okay. Uh, the, the, the tree is angled that direction. And, uh, you know, I placed this gin so that it comes down in the front. And everything looks good from this area, this uh, vantage point. So this is what I'm calling the front. So, let's see if we can use this wire or something else. What size pot do you see this ultimately going in? Um, well, you know, this is a training pot, and it's obviously too big, so I would say a pot about maybe half the size of this pot that it's in now. About the same thickness as the thickness of the trunk, as far as the depth of the pot? Yeah, you know, two, two and a half inches, maybe with this, uh, maybe... 10 inches in length. Uh, of course, everybody wants to put junipers in unglazed pots, you know, and uh, that's just the traditional way of doing that. And why is that? Why, what is the reason for putting it unglazed? Well, um, a lot of, basically, conifers are kind of a static tree. <laughs> They don't have a lot of color, and uh, they just have character. So the feeling is that you would want to uh, put it into a more earthen color. Otherwise, if you put it in a bright colored uh, glazed pot, it would detract from the tree. Just, you know, I, I've seen some junipers that were in glazed pots and they didn't look too bad. So it's just, you know, it's a traditional thing. So if you want to buck the trend and put your juniper in a glazed pot, then it's your juniper. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to buck the trend and put it in a glazed pot, that's fine. Just realize if you ever show it, you're going to have detractors. You're going to have arguments. Um, you might want to show it just to get some conversation started. But if you show it at a traditional show, you're going to have, you're going to have kickback. And that's why. When you put a tree on exhibit, it's no longer in your backyard. It's open season. Yep. You're asking it to be judged at that point. Exactly. And you absolutely can do non-traditional, but realize that you're opening an argument. <laughs> And if you're going to buck the trend, you better have thick skin. 
some people don't and they want to buck trend anyway and then you offer constructive criticism and or not constructive <laughs> or just a lot of people give... don't offer constructive criticism right. there's no doubt yeah. about that <laughs> But this is why Kawa is doing displays. That's why we're trying to have three local shows a year so people can get comfortable displaying their trees and get constructive criticism or non-constructive. Hopefully we can get back to doing that soon. <coughs> so you're using aluminum right now. Traditionally, um, they say use copper. Uh, can you explain a little bit of the benefits uh, of the two and what are your favorite for using on junipers? The benefits with aluminum is that it's cheaper. Uh, basically, if you're going to put a, uh, a tree on exhibit, of course, this tree's not going to be ready for an exhibit for quite some time. I would say probably four or five years. But um, copper wire, you can use a smaller wire to get the same effect, so it's a lot less obtrusive. So whenever you see a major exhibit of world-class trees, of course, the junipers are all wired. They're not... They don't have wire all over the primary branches, but the tertiary and some secondary branches are wired. And generally, uh, they're wired with copper because it's, you can use a smaller wire to get the same effect and it's much less obtrusive. Uh, you can actually wire a juniper for a show and, and not be able to see the wire with copper wire. That's the advantage of copper wire. The, you know, a lot of people get the idea that everybody else is wrong if you do it different. So, back when I first started, uh, Aluminum wire hadn't been invented yet. So everybody had to use copper. And we would go to uh, the hardware store and buy rolls of copper wire and take it home and anneal it ourselves. Because there was no such thing as annealed copper wire available. So I learned how to use copper wire a long time ago. But now I use mostly aluminum because it's just easier to use. Uh, it's easier to put on, it's easier to take off. Cheaper. And it's cheaper. And wire is temporary anyway, so. Just like what you just did, you decided you didn't want a branch. You cut it off and you could reuse that wire where if it was copper, it wouldn't have been easy, as easy to... Cut. Yeah, you have to yeah. cut it off. Once you put copper wire on, it hardens in place, and and that's it's done. Uh, you can't unwind it and move it to another branch. Period. So where do you see bonsai going in the next ten years in in uh, Florida? Seeing that you've seen it progress and change over the last twenty years, twenty three years since I've known you, what 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 do you see happening over the next ten years? Well, you know, people are getting, you know, the, the quality of trees has been improving for quite some time. So people that are doing it are fairly serious and, you know, people are doing better bonsai. I think there's just less of them. I, I think bonsai used to be a lot more popular than it is now, but the people that are doing it are more serious about it. 
That's just my opinion. Yeah, I'm of the opinion that we had a lull 10 years ago, but I mean, I'm seeing more and more people getting into it, taking the classes, getting excited than I did 20 years ago, for sure. Oh, is that right? For sure. I see it on um, commercials. I see it in TV shows. I see it in movies. More. I mean, Karate Kid was huge, but then we had a lull. Now it seems to get a little bit more ingrained in the culture. I mean, there's bonsai trees uh, in uh, Animal Crossing that just came out. <laughs> they have they have bonsai trees. Everybody has them in their gardens. What's that? It's a, just a, a game, which is in, you know, that's that's a new game that just came out from Nintendo. A video game? Yeah, it's a video game, and now they have bon they have bonsai trees in there huh. that you can buy and plant. Kind of neat. So we've talked about foliar feeding. We've talked about soil. Uh, let's talk about insects. What are you, some of the biggest issues you've had with junipers here in Central Florida? The number one big problem with junipers is red spider mites. Um, the winter time is our dry season and red spider mites love the dry season especially if it's hot hot and dry that's what they love so you have to really uh, really watch them for red spider mites how do you treat them well I put merit on it and some people have told me that uh, Merit attracts red spider mites, but I had never heard that before. No, I haven't either. <laughs> I've never heard that. I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> <laughs> but when I put merit on them, the spider mites go away. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about um, any topical sprays like Telstar or uh, Acephate? You can use all those. I prefer to use Merit. Um, you know, anytime you use a spray, uh, you're going to be breathing it in. You're going to be, you know, getting it on. You have to use gloves and, you know, any overspray, if it gets on your arm, it can be absorbed right into your skin. Um, so I prefer to use a, a granular systemic, which is what Merit is. Um, Merit is the, uh, it's the active ingredient in the Bayer uh, products. So, uh, it's just a good, a good thing for me. I've always, I've always liked merit. Have you had any success with any organic treatments like neem oil or um, mineral oil or horticultural oil? Or I have. Um, used uh, a product called sun spray uh, horticultural oil I bought a two gallon jug of it probably 20 years ago and I still haven't reached the bottom of that oh, yet. Wow. So, um, there those horticultural oils are good um, they have no residual uh, effect whatsoever and you have to be careful what time of day you put them on. So they're fairly limited. Uh, there again, it's time consuming. You have to mix it up and spray it on. And Merit, is a, you, can, you can buy it as a granule and just sprinkle it on the soil and the plant takes it up. And uh, it's 
easy. That's why I use it. The other, another problem that a lot of people don't realize with junipers is a pest called a bagworm. And um, if you're, what the bagworms will do, and they're hard to see, they, they eat the bark off the, you know, the little branches. So if you, if you have little branches that are starting to turn brown and you, and you start looking and there's a, a little blank spot in the, uh, in the bark, then you probably got a bagworm on there. And a lot of people don't even know what a bagworm is. So, uh, but I've, I've seen it a lot on junipers and, um, and they can do a lot of damage. So they're hard to see because they make a little cocoon out of the material that they're on. So they're pretty well camouflaged they can get pretty, pretty big, good size, and they can do a lot of damage to a juniper. So you really have to kind of watch junipers for, you know, bagworm damage. So scale bagworms. Have you had issues with? Uh, I'm sorry. Scale. Yeah, there's scale. Several kinds of scale that that. Um, tiny little scale that gets in between the, uh, the the needles and it almost looks like part of the needle until it gets turns into an infestation and then you have to either use a uh, oil spray or put a, a systemic on so uh, scale bagworms uh, mites, spider mites. Yep. How about a fungus? Do you have any much issues with fungus, and how do you treat for that? Yeah, fungus, uh, there's a couple of kinds of fungus. Um, there's a juniper blight, which you have to use a, uh, a product called HALT, uh, which is a little bit hard to find. Uh, it takes care of juniper blight. Uh, and juniper blight is a serious, it's a serious disease that uh, it will kill a juniper. So um, the biggest problem with junipers here, is fungus-wise, is uh, you know most junipers come from areas that are cooler than Florida. We have a, a native juniper here, but. Most of the junipers that we use for bonsai come from other areas. Uh, this one in particular is, is uh, very susceptible to uh, the fungus. When it, start, when it gets hot and rainy, you get a fungus on the tips and your tips start turning brown. So any good fungicide will take care of that. Uh, Dacanel, manicure, mancozeb. Mancozeb. Any, any good broad spectrum for uh, fungicide Clearies. will take care of that. Uh, yeah, Clearies is good. Uh, it's an easy thing to get rid of, but if you don't get rid of it, uh, it can do serious damage to your juniper. So explain, you're just putting movement in all the branches to more match the movement of the trunk, to give it a little bit more interest, putting them all in their own little place in the sun, making sure that you're eliminating any of the shoots that are growing right down. I, I saw that you cut a few of those, just helping them all um, have like more pads. Yeah, yeah. If you have movement in your trunk, then... You don't want branches that are sticking straight out like pencils. You want to have movement in your branches. So um, that's what I'm doing now is I'm putting movement in the branches and, uh, and making sure that none of the branches are covering other branches. 
basically you want to have when you, when it's all said and done you want to have a canopy that is you know more or less kind of full with no holes in it um, with different broken up layers yeah uh, the branches on the bottom need to be longer and the branches more toward as as with any bonsai the, the higher up in the tree the branches get the shorter they're going to be so the sunlight hits all the branches exactly yep. and the, the the branches in the upper part of the tree are younger so they're going to be shorter and smaller like any other tree so um i see you have your gin about four or five inches up from the base when you design the juniper what's the typical rule for putting the living canopy versus the dead gin should it be taller shorter same height um, does it matter artistic preference i don't think there is a a rule, um, you know, junipers can be, they come from a, if a juniper is growing in an adverse condition, it can actually have more dead wood than live. So, uh, there really is no rule as to, you know, where the dead wood has to be. I've seen, you know, I've seen junipers with you know, like I said, a lot more dead wood than live. So, um, some trees uh, have the uh, effect of being struck by lightning, which would be this. A lot of junipers grow in areas where they're under snowpack eight, nine months out of the year, and they get a lot of a lot of dead wood. Most, a lot of junipers come from areas where. It's just an adverse growing condition, you know, out in the deserts. Uh, they, they grow pretty good out in the deserts. And uh, it's pretty adverse there. And there they would only grow uh, a limited amount of time during the year. But uh, you know, it's such an adverse growing condition that we wind up with a lot of dead wood. So Where do you see the future of this tree going for the next couple of years? You see more dead wood, denser canopy, denser pads. Well, the canopy. More shari. The, the canopy is going to get denser. Um, it'll take probably two, three years to get the canopy where you want it. Um, you can, you know, depending on the taste of the person that winds up with this tree, you can extend this shari and, and connect these dead woods. Uh, it, it wouldn't look bad. There's enough movement in this trunk so that you can make it look really nice and, and then you could carve out part of the trunk. I'm not going to do that today, um, but because well i've got wire on here and uh you know you're talking another couple of hours of uh of carving and you know so it's not for the health of the tree to kind of let it settle from or that too right uh right now we're doing a lot to this tree so it needs to recover yeah so i would say it would be a lot better to wait on you know making all kinds of dead wood on it let it stabilize let for it, a year yeah you know um, but the the value of a juniper is in the dead wood uh, that's always been the case so the more dead wood you have as long as it looks like it's real dead wood rather than something that you know somebody carved out um, then that 
increases the value of the juniper. So if you really want to have a more valuable tree, then I would suggest, you know, taking this this gin here and shari making this shari all the way down the trunk and and then and then carve out part of the trunk, make it look a little more hollow rather than just you know round. Um, generally when when a large part of the juniper dies like this, it'll die all the way down into the into the roots because um, junipers connect the roots with with branches so if a major part of the tree dies then in nature it's going to die all the way down into the root so it, it would actually would look more natural to have this shari come all the way down into here and then carve out some of the some of the wood so that it looks like it's an old juniper that was in growing in adverse growing conditions and um, and that actually happened to it that would actually add to the value of this tree so do you have any questions Did he ask you? I don't know. He answered one of them. That yeah. Asked. You have a question? No. I'm just my battery's about to die, and I was funny. I answered your question that you didn't even ask. Mm-hmm. Amazing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at five years to show this, give or mm -hmm. take a year. About I four. In five years, this, you know, properly cared for, this should be a fabulous little tree. Uh, I, I really like this tree. I, I liked it when we first when we first looked at it. I said, yeah, I like that. And of the other trees that you showed me, I didn't like any of them better. So that's why I showed you that one first. Yeah. <laughs> you wanted to do it. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice tree. So I have a top here, um, you know, some people like a gin top and some people like a green top, so um, I'm not going to cut this short, I'm not going to cut any of these long shoots now for the health of the tree, but once, once these little branches down here start, uh, you know, growing strong, then this can be shortened into a... Uh, you can let it grow tall and have a gin top, or you can shorten it below and have the green as a backdrop for the gin, have a gin top. Uh, I'm kind of uh, leaning towards having the green down here and this actually being the, the apex of the tree is the gin. Basically, I'm like Jason said, I'm cutting all the branches that are growing straight down. That just cleans up the design. It's a nice tree, though. I like it. Awesome. There is our. Juniper demo, initial styling of a Blue Alps Juniper. Thank you all for watching. 
Sorry it was long, but it's real time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks.